Welcome. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, I want to say welcome to you. Uh, my name is Dr. Philip Carlson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church. And I want to come to you today with just a little lesson from God's Word. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2. And we're going to study through what would have been our normal Sunday school lesson if we were able to gather together physically. Um, but unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. But I don't want you to get behind. There's a lot of really great things for you to know here in Luke chapter 2. It's all about Jesus at the temple. And really, this is the only kind of recorded a narrative story about Jesus as a boy. And it's him and his parents, and they find him in the temple. And so Jesus wanted to be about his father's business is what he said and how he described it. I want you to think about your own life. If you grew up in the church, uh, you probably experienced a lot of time as a child sitting in a pew at church. What was that time like for you? Was that a time that you would say that you wanted and were excited about being there and you wanted to listen and hear? Or was it a time of a drudgery, drudgery monotony, and uh, boring uh, stuff? And now everybody's experience is different, and from week to week it may have been different. But Jesus had a desire to be about his Father's business and to hear God's Word. And so as a child, he even desired that. Uh, verse 40 of Luke chapter 2 says, And the child grew and became strong. The child that's referring to there is Jesus. And filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And then we see this incident when he was 12 years old. And then after that, Jesus is an adult. And so this is the only thing that we have about his childhood. Um, at this time, his parents actually were just returning from uh, Egypt to Nazareth. You'll remember they lived in Nazareth. And so they've been in Nazareth for a while, and now it's time for them to go up to the Feast of Passover in Jerusalem. So they're on kind of this trek. And this happens when Jesus is 12 years old, and he desires to stay in the temple. Uh, I found this great quote, and it says, When the child of God loves the Word of God and sees the Son of God, he is changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God because he has found the truth of God. And this underscores the importance of taking children to church, of being a child of God, because when the child of God loves the Word of God and sees the Son of God, then things change. By the Spirit of God, you're shaped into the image of God for the glory of God because you have found the truth of God. And so that really gets at the heart in a very interesting way of this lesson and why we need to expose ourselves constantly to the Scriptures. Uh, I want to look with you together at verses 40 through 47 of Luke chapter 2. Follow along with me if you will. It says, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And his parents, they went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But when they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So we're going to look at this together, uh, and we're going to notice a few interesting things about Jesus and his childhood. But first I want you to notice in verse 40, it says he grew and became strong, and was filled with wisdom. Now, you know that Jesus is a fully man and fully God. He was fully divine and fully human, and those two natures worked together in the one person of Jesus. And so how did they work exactly? That's the mystery of what we know in theology as the hypostatic union. The, the God nature and the human nature together into one individual, the person, Jesus, uh, part of the Godhead. And so we know that he had a normal humanity. He was fully human. He was born of a virgin. He grew up. He was a toddler. He was a baby. Uh, he had all those normal human experiences. And as a child, he grew and became strong. It says he was filled with wisdom, which I think is an interesting phrase because... 
You'll note that he didn't grow in wisdom like normal human beings do exactly. He was filled with special wisdom, I think, from the Holy Spirit. Sure, he did grow by gaining knowledge and learning how to use it, grew in wisdom in the normal human way, but he was also filled with wisdom. You remember being God and man, I think Jesus had a special relationship with the Holy Spirit who revealed things to him uh, because of that special nature. He was a very, very unique person. But when people looked at him, they saw a normal person, a normal human person, a normal child of 12 years old, for example, which is why they were amazed when they uh, heard his answers to some of the questions, but mostly when he asked them questions. That's not normal, typically, for a child to be always desiring to understand more of the Word of God but it can be a thing that you can foster in your children. So we see at the very beginning here, we're reminded that Jesus is unique. We're reminded that He's a perfect man and God, two natures in one person. He's not a mixture of some of this and some of that. He is holy both at the same time. And we're told the favor of God was upon Him. And that word favor actually is the Greek word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. You may have heard Someone named Charis, perhaps. And this is only uh, this is one of only two places where the Greek word charis is used in the book of Luke, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, an important word like grace, an important concept in the Christian life of grace, and it's only used twice in the whole Gospel of Luke. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> uh, not only is it only mentioned twice, it's the only place where uh, grace is mentioned in the Gospels with one exception. The only other place the word charis occurs is in John chapter 1 verse 17. It says the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So even though it's such an important doctrine, why do you think it is that it only occurs uh, these so few times in the Gospels? Think about that for a moment how special grace is, how big of a concept it is in the Christian's life, and it occurs so few times in the Gospels. I think the reason that is, is because <clears throat> the one who was grace, the one who is grace, Jesus himself is grace, and he was there among them physically. When all the accounts the Gospels are talking about here, grace was personified in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the grace of God is not expressed in words, it's expressed as a living reality in the Gospels. What a great concept that is. And here we see that word in verse 40. Uh, going on then, the next account we see is Jesus at the temple. His parents are in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And that's important to know that they actually uh, upheld the law and sought to fulfill the law. And they were very honorable when it comes to working with the law. And so they went up for this time of Passover in Jerusalem. And they journeyed then, as they were leaving, Jesus was 12 years old, and then when the feast was ended, they were leaving, and they realized they were supposing that Jesus was with the group in some way. Maybe he was with some friends or family, and they were traveling, and you know they were all walking in a caravan, perhaps. And then they finally realized, <clears throat> Jesus is not with us. Where is he? We've lost the God-man. We've lost... This child, this special child that God put in our care, he's all of a sudden is absent. And you know, that's one interesting point here. Don't we all make the mistake of supposing that Jesus is with us on the journey uh, all the time? Don't we make the mistake of assuming that, that we don't stop to realize, hey, as I was going on my journey, as I was headed through life, did I depart from where Jesus was? Did I leave him behind in some way? Did I go off in my own direction? Have I experienced that tragedy in my life? Have I given him up in some way and just didn't realize it or know it? Mary and Joseph failed in some ways because of this. They supposed that Jesus was present with them. And you know, an interesting um, comparison here is also thinking about Mary Magdalene. You remember when she went to the tomb, she also supposed something. She supposed that Jesus was absent. 
Uh, Mary and Joseph supposed that Jesus was present with them. They found out that he wasn't. Mary Magdalene supposed that Jesus was absent, but he was actually there. Both of these are failures that are so common in our everyday experience. How can we get past those moments of uh, feeling alienated, of assuming Jesus' presence instead of assuring that it's there with us? I think the first step in recovery is to miss his presence. To, to come to a realization, oh, he is not here, or oh, I have departed from him in some way. To miss that presence, the second step would be to seek after him. So once you realize he's gone, then you seek after him in some way. You go after him to get him back, to come back onto the right path of walking. Isn't it a tragedy when we can be found among our friends and missing our own fellowship, but we never come to the point of actually missing Jesus in our lives? The third step, I think, would be to retrace our steps, to go back where we have been and find out where is it that we lost Him, or where did we leave Him, where did we walk away from Him. And at that place, we can make the decision to turn around and follow Him, to go on the right path. Notice it was the third day that they found him. It says after three days they found him in the temple. So they were searching for him and after three days they finally found him. <clears throat> How um, unnerving would that be as a parent? And where did they find him exactly? He was sitting among the teachers listening to them and asking them questions. He wasn't teaching them, which is an important thing to note. He was sitting among them, listening to them, asking them questions. He wasn't the one instructing them, although I'm sure he knew enough that he could have done that. But he was alive with interest. The teachers were amazed at Jesus and how he was interacting with them. Uh, the verb extensimi, it means they, it says, it's translated as they were amazed, but it means they stood outside of themselves. They were astonished at Jesus' actions and uh, that he heard their questions and that he uh, or he heard their teaching and he had questions to respond to it. You know, young people and children can learn a lot from this because of the Lord's choice of company. Where did he go? What did he seek to do during these times? Days he's staying there with these teachers. He's seeking the company of those who are wiser than himself at this time, uh, who have lessons that they can teach him and experience that they can share with him, particularly about God. Because that's what these teachers were doing. They were sharing the words of God from the Old Testament. And Jesus wanted to know about that. I don't think that he just possessed the knowledge. He had to learn about these things. And what did Jesus say when his parents came to him? That's what we're going to look at next. <clears throat> his parents, they realized after three days that he was gone. And what does Mary say to him? She realizes that Jesus prioritizes his father's work. Listen to verse 48. It says, When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be, about my I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the things that he spoke to them. So we see an interesting contrast here between <clears throat> his parents and his reaction. We don't normally react to our parents that way, but what did Mary say? She says, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus said, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Mary had said, your father. Jesus had said, my father. But notice also Jesus was calm and undisturbed, even though he had been away from his parents for a time. When they found him, he was calm, sitting with the teachers, and they asked, Why have you treated us so? We've been in great distress. He said, I have to be about my father's business. Even though Mary said, Your father, Jesus said, My father. What an interesting relationship here. Not talking about Joseph, but talking about his heavenly father. You know, his first recorded words in the Gospels, right here, Jesus' first recorded words, he's talking about being in his Father's house. And I want to ask you this, do you remember what Jesus' last recorded words are? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His first recorded words 
are talking about his Father in heaven. And his last recorded words are talking about his Father in heaven. And so Jesus always had the right priorities. He always was thinking about things the right way. Even when he cried, it is finished. You know, the interesting thing is that Jesus prioritizes the mission of God in his life. And so the question I have for you is, how do you prioritize what God's plan is for you or his mission for you in your life? I think the way that we do that as humans is we constantly always try to seek God. We try to seek him in prayer. We try to follow his commands in the scriptures because these are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. These are God's words breathed out and preserved for us. And so by searching these, by knowing these, by hiding them in our heart, we can make them our priority. We can pray. We can seek opportunities to share the gospel. We can aim to love God and love our neighbor. We can commit wholeheartedly to serving in our church all things that the scriptures tell us we should be about. That is our mission. Here we see Jesus about his mission and that's the same way we should be even from an early age. But that's not where this uh, section ends. Let's read the last couple of verses. Uh, chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. It says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus increased in those ways because he was about his father's business and his father's mission. Uh, the, the grace that Jesus experienced and grew with shows that he was subjected to his father's will. And that's a difficult thing in our life. We should use that as an example to us. To, we have this perfect example of how Jesus submitted in the same way we should submit and have perfect obedience. If it was right for Jesus, then it is right for us as well. In what areas of your life are you encouraged to obey the Lord because of Jesus' obedience to even his sinful parents? We're told he went down with them to Nazareth and he was submissive to them. So in what areas of life are we encouraged to obey because of the way Jesus obeyed? There are so many times in our life we have to obey in submission to authorities who are over us, just as Jesus did here. How often do we want to stand up and have our own way and not be submissive to those authorities that God puts in our life? We need to follow the example of Jesus, who had perfect obedience. And did you notice in verse 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth. Jesus was called a Nazarene because he grew up in Nazareth. He spent a lot of time there. Um, and Nazareth was not a glamorous place. It was a conjunction in an area with a conjunction of different roads that carried commerce in different areas and would have allowed Jesus to experience a lot of the world or of people, uh, commerce, and those kind of things. But Nazareth was not the cleanest or nicest place. Actually, if you have a Bible map in the back of your Bible, let me refer you there. You can see Nazareth up here by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, notice, when we see these areas, we normally think of Jerusalem and Bethlehem down here in Judea. But Nazareth is all the way up here by the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth right there. Notice in your map you've got this little um, area here. That's where Nazareth is. Uh, don't forget, you have a lot of really great resources bound up with the text of the Bible. Some Bibles have concordances and those kind of things. Useful at times. So, what was Nazareth like? Well, I found this interesting story by H.A. Ironside. Ironside wrote a lot of great commentaries. And he told of an incident of a time where he and his wife visited Palestine in 1936. So, it may have changed a lot since then. It says they were on a journey from Damascus to Jerusalem. And having passed through many places, hallowed once by the Lord's presence, they finally came to Nazareth. Poverty and need were apparent everywhere. An open drain carrying raw sewage ran beside the road. Mrs. Ironside stood in the street as her husband went to look at a site in which he had interest. Turning back, he found his wife weeping. And when he asked the cause of her tears, she responded, can it really be that the Lord of all 
was here. Yes, yes he was. For almost 30 years, he lived in Nazareth as a normal human, because he was a human. Jesus' humanity tells us that we can be assured that he has gone through many of the things that we have experienced, that he was tempted in the ways that we were, and that he can provide the perfect sacrifice through his death for us. He experienced the common human experience, growing thirsty, growing tired, being weary, having sorrow, and having pain. Jesus experienced all that. It's important to note that at each stage in his life, he was perfect for that stage. What's it like to be a boy in adolescence? Jesus knows he lived it. What's it like to be a toddler? He knows he lived it. You know, we have some um, kind of fictitious accounts of what Jesus' life may have been like as a child, and I'll share those with you on another video. And they involve kind of ridiculous incidences that wouldn't make sense for Jesus as we know him. <clears throat> Jesus was a normal child. He didn't uh, do things out of spite and he didn't have sinful attitudes, but otherwise, he was perfectly normal. And he submitted himself to that humility of humanness. He gave up his prerogatives as deity so that he could be the perfect example and the perfect uh, sacrifice for us and provide salvation in a way for us. And so when we look at these times in Jesus' life, uh, particularly we think about his childhood, remember that he is the perfect example and seek to follow that example. Thanks for spending some time with me today.